Good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Dacey. I'm the Executive Director of the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics here at the American University. We want to welcome you this evening on behalf of our co-sponsors, the School of Public Affairs at American University. We welcome you tonight to our book discussion, which is um, entitled Medicare for All, a Citizen's Guide. We're so excited to have you here this evening as we welcome back one of our Sign Institute fellows in the original cohort from 2019, Dr. Abdul al Sahid, who will be joining us this evening, and his co-author, Dr. Micah Johnson. Um, my pleasure is that I get to introduce to you our moderator, who is Professor Aparna Soni, who is an assistant professor of public administration and policy at American University. She studies the impacts of public programs and policies of individual health. She is well published on this subject. Um, Professor Sony, we are so excited to have you here moderating this conversation. I know you're going to introduce the authors. Just a quick bit of uh, housekeeping. I want to remind you to go and put your questions in the Q&A. We certainly want to get to as many questions as possible as I'm sure you'll have on this topic. And a little later on in the chat function, we'll be sharing um, a link to the website for the authors authors and also a way to access the book uh, as well. We encourage you at the Sign Institute to sign up to our social media and certainly sign up for our newsletter to find out new and exciting programming and always to keep up with what our fellows are up to. Uh, Professor Sony, it, it's yours and we look forward to, to your discussion um, this evening. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's event. We are very fortunate to have both authors of Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide here with us today. Dr. Abdul El Said is a physician, epidemiologist, educator, author, speaker, and podcast host. His newsletter, The Incision, cuts to the heart of the trends shaping our moment. His three books include Healing Politics, which calls for a politics of empathy to cure our epidemic of insecurity, and today's book, Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide with Dr. Micah Johnson. Abdul is the host of America Dissected, a podcast by Crooked Media, which goes beyond the headlines to explore what really matters for our health. He is also a senior fellow at, at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a scholar in residence at Wayne State University and our very own American University where he teaches at the intersection of public health, public policy, and politics. He was formerly the health director of, for the city of Detroit and a candidate for the governor of Michigan in 2018. And our second speaker, Dr. Micah Johnson, is a physician and a healthcare researcher, a writer, and a policy advisor. He served as the health policy fellow in the US House of Representatives and has advised presidential campaigns on healthcare reform. He holds a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar and he received his MD from Harvard Medical School. He is currently a resident physician in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. My short introductions in no way does justice to the distinguished careers and many, many public policy contributions of both our speakers. But I know that we're all eager to hear from them so I'll start right away by asking Abdul and Micah how this wonderful collaboration came about. What inspired both of you to write this book? First of all, I should unmute my uh, mic. You think a year into this pandemic, we know how to use Zoom well by now, but um, but here we are. And uh, first, I just wanna say thank you uh, to, uh, to the Sign Institute, to um, the School of Public Affairs at American uh, for hosting this event tonight, and to you, uh, Professor Sony, for uh, moderating what I hope will be uh, a fruitful and meaningful discussion for folks. Um, we're really grateful to, to, to be back in the way that one can be back in the pandemic uh, to a place that I really enjoyed spending time uh, back in 2019. And um, to, to be doing it around a book uh, that actually, the, the idea for which hatched right around that time. And that was because uh, Mike and I got to know each other well in the context of uh, my campaign for governor of Michigan. And I knew, um, that I wanted to write uh, to, to run on a state level single payer platform. Uh, and there were very few other people that I could think of who uh, could bring a level of insight, perspective, um, and agility to the question of putting that together 
uh, alongside me and our policy director, Rihanna Gunwright, um, than, than Micah. And I'd gotten to know Micah actually first at a, uh, a leadership retreat at Rhodes House in Oxford. Um, and, uh, and actually that's where I got to know my, my policy director, Rihanna as well. And then we all sort of came back for a, an encore um, during my campaign. And afterwards, you know, one of the things that we realized was really frustrating about this conversation is that most folks have, have heard about, reckoned with the concept of single payer healthcare or Medicare for all in the context of a political conversation. And we didn't feel like that was the right place to be having this discussion. Instead, we wanted to create a tool by which people could situate the discussion about our healthcare within the context of their day-to-day -day lives, rather than a conversation about a state budget or a federal budget, it's probably better to be having a conversation about a kitchen table budget and um, what uh, our healthcare system means uh, for the lived experience of everyday folks. And, and that was the goal of writing this citizen's guide. I'll pass it on to Micah, who has obviously a different perspective than me, uh, to share his, uh, his insights on, on, on what brought us to writing this. And thanks again to American and to the Sign Institute and to you, Professor Sony, for hosting us. Really glad to be here. And for me, I've always been someone who's believed that healthcare is a human rights. And I went to medical school in Massachusetts, a state where almost everyone has some form of health insurance, but it's just not enough. And almost every day, whether you're in the clinic or you're in the hospital, you see the way that patients are being failed in small and big ways by our system, whether it's co-pays and deductibles they can't afford or surprise out of network bills or going bankrupt because they got the care that they did need or getting sick or even dying because they didn't get the care that they needed. So that led me to believe that we need to, to go bigger. We need more fundamental reforms to the healthcare system. And when I worked with Abdul on the single payer plan for Michigan, I, I would come back and talk to my friends in medicine. They say, hey, is there some, some book I can read? To, to learn more about what you're all up to. And at that time, there just wasn't. And I think Medicare for all is an issue that has catapulted so quickly from the sidelines of our national conversation right into the spotlight. And I think it's taken us all some time to really bring the rigor to the issue that it demands in terms of the history, the political considerations, and also the policy considerations. So what we hope for the book is that it's a one-stop shop for people who want to really get deeper in this issue. And I'm excited about tonight because both over the last few years and then even more so during the pandemic, we've seen the need for big reforms to our, to our healthcare system. So thanks again for, for having us and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you both for sharing. And for those in the audience who have not yet had the opportunity to read the book, I highly recommend it. I think that it accomplishes uh, all the goals that Abdul and Micah set and more. I'd now like to turn our discussion to the Medicare for All program. Abdul, could you tell us more about the unique benefits of Medicare for All? We know that there are multiple pathways to get to universal coverage. What makes Medicare for All superior to say, a public option with an individual mandate or another model? Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question. And um, to situate folks in the discussion about health care I want folks to appreciate um, how our system uh, often tends to work. And um, if you'll permit me just a little bit of, um, of exposition for a second, imagine the healthcare industry is these two different sectors that are constantly interacting with each other um, to, to, to simplify things here. You've got the payer industry, which is insurance. Payer is just a fancy way of saying insurance. They're the ones who pay for healthcare. And you've got providers, right? Who are the doctors, hospitals, clinics, et cetera, where you actually seek care. Notice I'm not saying anything about you because you're like this little thing right here in the inside, okay? And if you're lucky enough to get health insurance in this country, which 10% of people are not because they've been priced out, and I'll explain why in a second, what's happening is that uh, you and your employer are paying uh, for the privilege of having insurance, the operative word here is sure, right? And you're paying that in the form of this thing called a premium. There's very little that's premium about it. It's just the name that we give it. Um, and you pay that monthly or every other, every, every other week. And then if you get sick, you then go to one of these providers uh, for your care. They then bill your insurance, right? Who in most circumstances in today's uh, world will then bill you again um, through this thing called a deductible or a copay uh, to pay for the insurance you thought you already had. Now, what's happening here, right? Is that the way prices get set in our system uh, is based on this negotiation between uh, providers and payers. And 
they negotiate so that they can outcompete one another, right? So you got a payer here, a provider here, and a payer here, and they're in competition with one another. And what's happening is these prices get set in ways so that they can uh, maneuver and maximize their position uh, in uh, their sector. And uh, what tends to happen is that these prices get negotiated in ways uh, that drive up uh, overall costs for everyone, uh, necessitating uh, insurance to create these things like deductibles, like copays, et cetera. What Medicare for All does is instead of having a whole bunch of payers, you have one payer, right? And that is the federal government. It insures you the minute you're born, the minute you turn 26, the minute you uh, get married, the minute you get divorced, the minute you get a job, the minute you lose a job, the minute you turn 65, it doesn't matter, you got one insurer. And because that insurer is the federal government, right? It sets prices for all of this care independent of who the actual provider is. And so rather this, than this escalating system that tends to raise prices, it keeps prices stable for everybody. Uh, and because it's the government, it covers everybody. Uh, and then on top of that, all of this crosstalk between payers and providers, that, that's really complex and it requires a whole overhead uh, system of uh, various billers, et cetera, that go away uh, because you've got one insurance program for everyone. And so one of the, 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 the points that you asked in, in the question was there are a lot of ways to universal coverage. But the point that I guess we're trying to make throughout the book is that not all coverage is the same. And universal coverage is actually that premise of the conversation has benefited insurance companies because they'll say, well, we provide coverage. We need more of us. And that, that's, not actually, that's not actually accurate because the sure part of insurance has started to fade away. Uh, and um, I'm actually going to pass it to, to, to uh, Micah here. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to talk about one of our patients, one of the patients that we uh, interviewed for the book, her name is Lisa. And, and, and she, I think her story best captures the failure of our insurance to be anything near sure. Uh, Micah, take it away. Yeah, one of, one of the, the people that Abdul and I had in mind when we're writing about Medicare for All is this woman named Lisa Cardillo. And she's the kind of person who's supposed to be doing well in our healthcare system. She and her husband have private employer-based insurance through her husband's job as an automotive engineer. And she was in her 30s when she developed a rare form of a heart attack and spent nine days in a hospital in Michigan. And thankfully, she survived the cardiac arrest. She survived the resuscitation and then was saddled with bills for years. The first bill they got from the hospital was over $100,000, not to mention then the defibrillator vest she had to wear, another $5,000 a month. Then all the prescriptions, the rehab, the imaging, it was all so much that they had to throw a GoFundMe to try to just cover their bills for the year. But then of course, January 1st rolled around and their deductible reset and they had to keep paying more and more and more. So. It's people like Lisa who are hurting in this system too. We think a lot about um, the 30 million Americans who are uninsured, which is a travesty, and the low-income people on, on Medicaid face their own problems. But even middle-class people like Lisa with so-called good private insurance are struggling in this system. So the idea is that, as Abdul says, not all coverage is created equal. And employer-based health insurance that almost half of the country relies on it simply eroded over the last few decades. And not only is that a reason why Medicare for all will be more helpful um, to those folks, it's also, I think, a reason why the political movement around this has accelerated. Because the feelings of being sold short in our healthcare system and facing either indignity or injustice, those are very widespread experiences in American life. And I think that's one of the reasons that so many people have organized and are starting to, to build the momentum around this idea. Thank you both for sharing. Um, as you mentioned, you know, Lisa's story as well as many others show that simply having insurance does not guarantee good healthcare coverage. And you mentioned in the book that 87 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured. So I'd like to ask Micah, in your view, as both a physician and a policy advisor, what role would you say uninsurance has played in the way that we saw the COVID-19 pandemic roll out in the US? And do you think that a system like Medicare for All could have made a difference? Absolutely. And again, sometimes we think that having bad insurance is a narrow problem, but as, as you just mentioned, it's about half 
of adults under age 65 have inadequate health insurance. And I think that really set us up for failure during the pandemic. You have, it's people who are afraid to get tested for COVID because they're not sure if they're gonna get charged for it, afraid to go to their doctor's office or into the hospital to get care for COVID. And then of course, you've got millions of people with job-based health insurance who lost their jobs. So those people were, were behind the eight ball. And again, this is, it's a public health crisis. It's a communicable virus. So when you have millions of people who aren't able to get the care they need, that hampers our ability to beat back the pandemic. But it's not just the insurance system, it's also our bodies that weren't prepared for the COVID pandemic. When you have half of adults that don't have adequate health insurance, who have gone without reliable primary care or without getting proper treatment for their conditions, whether it's lung disease or heart disease. And I saw this when I worked in our ICU with COVID patients. If you've gone decades without treatment for your medical issues, you are going to be sicker when you contract this virus. And I think, unfortunately, that happened to so many Americans, and it doesn't have to be that way. And with Medicare for All, not only would everyone get insurance the day Medicare for All is passed, they would keep it for their whole life. And for those of us who work in primary care, we know that it's about having reliable access to healthcare year in and year out, both to stay healthy and to get treatment for your chronic diseases is what keeps people healthy in the long run. So I think things could be so much different under a universal healthcare system like Medicare for All. And we know that it's not a question of if, but when the next pandemic strikes. And I think that putting in the foundation now, like Medicare for All, would really set us up well for, for when, unfortunately, this, this could happen again. Thank you, Micah. So we've covered a, a lot of the potential benefits of Medicare for All. I'd now like to ask Abdul to respond to one of the common arguments against a single payer system. So your book very clearly presents how a single payer system like Medicare for All can cut down these exorbitant prices that we see for drugs and healthcare services. However, some would argue that this would reduce the financial incentives for pharmaceutical research and development and other medical innovation, which could hurt patients in the long run. How would you respond to that argument? Well, I would uh, use this example of the vaccine uh, that we are all um, watching get deployed. And there are a couple of aspects of that that I, I want to highlight. The first is that, um, you know, while the vaccines carry a corporate name, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, um, they were the product largely of either uh, direct research funding from the federal government through Operation Warp Speed or indirect funding uh, through the research that was unlocked by the NIH well in advance. Moderna uh, is itself a product of government research dollars uh, invested in understanding how you could leverage RNA uh, to create a vaccine, right? It's, it's, it's the Moderna RNA part of the end of it uh, actually is about that. And it, it came out of um, government research. Um, that is the case with all of the medications that uh, have come to market, all of them in some part or another. Uh, originated through NIH funded research, whether it was through a university uh, or directly at the NIH. And so the notion, right, that early stage research is paid for by the pharmaceutical industry is just not actually true. Um, it's funded and paid for by the federal government uh, and then bought up by biotech firms and then bought up by major corporations uh, who then get to put their name on it and talk about how they you know, invested in all, in all of this R&D. Uh, when you look at the major uh, corporations, um, you know, the Bristol Meyer Squibs, the Johnson & Johnsons, they spend substantially more um, uh, in uh, advertising than they do in, uh, in research and development. And we've got to, you know, bake that into the prices that we all ultimately pay. That's number one. The second point is this, is that you can, you can identify and invest in all of the amazing drugs that you want, but if you can't get them to people, it doesn't quite matter, right? So for the 10% of people who are locked out of our healthcare system, uh, they don't benefit that much when you know, we devise a new drug because they just don't get access to healthcare in the first place. And then on top of that, to subsidize all of that, a lot of what the pharmaceutical corporations do is just raise the prices on drugs that we've already had. I mean, the patent for diabetes, the, the, the key diabetes drug, right, um, uh, insulin, that was sold for a dollar um, way back when. And the idea that somehow uh, they should just be raising the prices to you know, make profits off of the rest of us um, seems to run very, very counter to the overall goal of providing people their medication. Um, and then the, the last point I'll say is that um, even for folks who are insured, if our uh, healthcare industry lacks the capacity 
to move medications out into the communities that we need, uh, well, it doesn't really quite matter. And you know, in a lot of ways, when you think about um, what the limitation has been with the vaccines, we pulled off this medical miracle as a society uh, of generating a vaccine from soup to nuts in less than a year. And then we couldn't figure out how to get it to people in a meaningful, meaningful time frame. And so it's like we built a McLaren X1 engine and then dropped it into the body of a Ford Pinto. And our Ford Pinto healthcare system um, simply doesn't work the way it needs to. And so, uh, so much of what we ought to be able to do ought to be around providing really high quality primary care in the communities that people actually live, uh, work and, and, and play in um, to make sure that everyone has access to uh, the innovations that uh, our taxpayer dollars fund um, and then make sure that, uh, that we can um, uh, uh, manufacture them in ways that is sustainable. And so uh, I think we've got, in, in the current system, we've got the system flipped a little bit um, and Medicare for All would help us to unflip it. Thank you, Abdul. It's very true that the current pandemic has uh, certainly shed a lot of light on the, the holes in our current system. We have a question from an audience member, which I'd like to pose to Micah. Um, so another common criticism of, uh, of a single payer system, and this question is from Heather, who is an AU alum who is currently in Maryland. Uh, so she asks uh, about a, another common criticism of single payer systems are that they often have very long waits on procedures. We hear stories from countries like Canada and the UK about patients having to wait a very long time for procedures. Uh, we also see criticism of the VA right here in the US for long waits and substandard care. So are you worried or concerned at all that a Medicare for all type system might lead to some of these same issues here in the US? So thanks Heather for the question. I would say first in terms of thinking about the different kinds of universal healthcare systems around the world, there are a couple different models, but two of the main ones are one would be like the British National Health Service, where the government owns most of the hospitals and employs most of the doctors and other clinicians directly. So that's like the VA system that we have here in the US, but that's not like Medicare for All would be. Medicare for All would be more like Canada, a true single payer system where the insurance is public and funded by tax dollars, but the doctors in the hospitals would stay private. So that's the model that is most similar um, to what Medicare for all would be. And of course, it's like Medicare today. Folks who are on Medicare, the payment goes through the government and is funded by taxpayers, but you still go to any private doctor or, or hospital. In terms of the, the quality of care in, this, in these systems, you know, there are as many anecdotes in terms of the successes and failures of the American healthcare system as there are abroad, when you look at systematic comparisons of things like wait times or access to care, Americans fare similarly or worse than other countries do on many of these measures in terms of things like how long does it take you to get an appointment? Um, and one of the reasons is, is that America, we have fewer doctors and fewer hospitals than other countries do. And that's, I think, one of the biggest misconceptions in our healthcare debate is that we often think that we spend so much because we're getting more healthcare. Um, but in most cases, that's, that's simply not true. We go to the doctor less, we go to the hospital less. It's more of a factor that when we do get the care, we just get charged 50% or even 100% more than our peers do in other countries. And I think another way that we can look at this is we can compare the experience of people in our own country today who are on Medicare, or those who are on private insurance. And I think there are two things we should know about this. One is when you ask people on Medicare, how do you feel about the quality of your care and how easy it is for you to access the doctors and tests and procedures? And people on Medicare are similarly and actually slightly more satisfied uh, with their, the quality of their care than folks are on private insurance. And nevertheless, when folks who have private insurance, when they turn 65 and go on to Medicare, their healthcare costs go down immediately by about 30%. And that's for the very simple reason that Abdul described at the top of the program. Medicare is a national program that has the negotiating power to get better prices from doctors and hospitals and to pass on those savings to the American people. 
So under Medicare for All, the idea would be that everyone would be able to, to benefit from the kinds of savings that folks on Medicare are getting today. Thank you, Micah. And this is one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is that uh, you both presented uh, quite a bit of data and statistics, um, which oftentimes uh, tell a different story than the, the anecdotes that we might hear in the media or from friends. And thank you, Heather, for the question. A friendly reminder to all of our audience members that you can pose a question at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. My next question is for Abdul. These days with each passing birthday, I'm reminded of long-term care. Long-term care is one of the most expensive line items in healthcare and one of the fastest growing. How do you think Medicare for All would change the financing and provision of long-term care in the US? Yeah, um, th there are, first I wanna decouple the conversation about long-term care and Medicare for All because long-term care really is something that we should be covering through Medicare writ large, just, just like that, right? Because it is such a critically expensive line item. It is getting harder and harder to provide long-term care services in uh, the, um, you know, what is, what is ultimately the, uh, the, 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 the economy we don't see, right? Uh, th this, this work is being subsidized by uh, people who are taking care of their loved ones who are aging, um, even as they're caring for their kids. Um, and usually the burden of that because of, you know, structural misogyny falls on women. And, um, you know, the, the consequence are that it, uh, it, it creates this, um, this sort of sandwich generation that, that, that we talk about. And it also uh, forces many um, people out of the workforce. Um, and again, disproportionately women. Um, so this is something that we as a society ought to be providing anyway. The, then the question becomes, well, would Medicare for all make Medicare plus long-term care more sustainable? And I think the answer to that um, is yes. And, and the reason why is because, you know, oftentimes when you, when you sort of think about a simple um, approach to uh, Medicare, when, when, when seniors hear that Medicare for all uh, would provide everyone the same services they get, our sort of zero sum approach to this says, oh, well, we've got a pie that's being split over more pieces. It must mean that I get less of the pie. That's not really how an insurance pool works. The way an insurance pool works is that um, the people who add more money in than they take out tend to make that insurance pool more sustainable. And so if we did the thing that Medicare should do as a society, which is offer long-term care, the best way to make it sustainable plus long-term care would be to add more young people into the system because they tend to put more money into the system than they take out. And so yes, would Medicare for all make uh, it easier for us to provide a service that Medicare should offer? Yes, it would. And um, that's because it would make Medicare writ large more sustainable and put more money into the insurance pool uh, from which Medicare draws. And then um, we, we just need to, to solve the, the fact that in this country, uh, we leave it to, um, to uh, uh, people to provide for their seniors and their elders in ways uh, that are frankly unsustainable. And, um, and, and this is a problem that we need to solve as a society. Thank you, Abdul. And a follow-up question related to that. Uh, so you touched upon the financing for Medicare for All. Could you tell us a little bit more about the financing for Medicare for All and what it would look like? How would the country pay for all these benefits that Medicare for All could provide? So I can speak to that. So the first thing to know is that the most expensive healthcare plan in the world is the current American healthcare plan, which is to essentially have this mishmash of public, private system with high prices and all sorts of holes. That's actually the most expensive system you can possibly have, right? We spend twice as much than the average of our peer countries. So it shouldn't be surprising to us that switching to a more unified, streamlined system like Medicare for All would save money. Um, but it almost sounds too good to be true. So let's, let's break it down a little bit. There are two big reasons why Medicare for All saves money. One is what I mentioned before, is that Medicare is able, as a big national program, can negotiate better prices to buy healthcare. So Medicare now gets, depending on the service, a 30 to 50% discount over private insurance. So under Medicare for All, we would finally have the ability to rein in the high prices for care. And then the second piece is we spend an extraordinary amount of money just administering the healthcare system. 
So I always think of the Duke University hospital system that has 1,000 hospital beds, but 1,600 billing clerks. That's how much staff it takes just to navigate the incredibly complicated system we have. And then I think about the Cleveland Clinic in my home state of Ohio that has 3,000 contracts with different insurance plans. Each one of them has a negotiated price for 70,000 different services. So that means the Cleveland Clinic has 210 million prices for services. And to keep up with that requires an extraordinary amount of money. And that's why in the US, we spend $2,500 per person just administering the healthcare system. North of the border in Canada, they spend about $500 per year. So we're talking about saving thousands of dollars for every single American per year by switching over to, to the Medicare for All system. So those are some of the reasons why Medicare for All would save money. Of course, the big difference is that instead of paying for healthcare through insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs, that would now be covered by the federal government and would be funded by progressive taxes. And that, again, would be a huge benefit for people with low incomes or even middle-class folks who currently bear a disproportionate burden of our national $4 trillion healthcare bill. By switching over to a progressive financing system where wealthy folks and big companies and corporations would be paying more, that also means that low-income folks and folks in the middle class would be paying much less for healthcare. Thank you, Micah. Um, I would now like to ask a question from an audience member, and I will pose the question to Micah, given your role as a healthcare provider. So the question is about how providers feel about Medicare for all. How would the lower negotiated rates for providers that would happen with a program like Medicare for all affect both current physicians' incentives for providing their best care, as well as the incentives for young people to become physicians, um, thinking about the pipeline of new physicians. And this question is from Susan from Annapolis. So thanks, Susan, for the question. And I think it's an important one because we're at a watershed moment in terms of where the healthcare profession stands on ideas like Medicare for All. And one of the threads of history that we that we show in the book is how the medical profession and particularly the American Medical Association has a long history of opposing all sorts of reforms uh, that would expand health insurance coverage. Uh, they were the primary opponents in the 1940s to Harry Truman's national health care plan. They were the primary opponent to Medicare in the 1960s. And what is remarkable is that today we're, we're seeing a big shift. And you saw last year, um, not the AMA, but the second biggest physician group, the American College of Physicians, very mainstream physician group, come out in support of Medicare for All as a path toward universal coverage. And I think there are, there are a few reasons for this. And one of them is that in the past, being a physician was more like being an independent business owner and you controlled your own practice and you were kind of you know, in charge. Now with the corporatized, corporatization of healthcare where it's the big hospitals and the big insurance companies who really have the most power and the physicians are, are more like frontline workers now. Physicians now for many of us have more common cause with the nurses and pharmacists and environmental service workers who are there shoulder to shoulder working on the front lines than we do with the executives, even at the healthcare institutions that employ, them, employ us. So I think those are some of the reasons why we're seeing such a big shift of doctors moving, moving towards um, these ideas. And you know, in, in the book, if we go into more detail about how, how different specialties would be affected, how different hospitals would be affected, and those questions are all very important. And I think that's a lot of what um, uh, Susan has in mind asking that question. But the, the, the big picture is, uh, I'm, I'm now distracted because Abdul has an incredible special guest in his frame. Um, but just to say that we're in, we're in a really important moment for a shift in the profession. Thank you, Micah. This is a very, a very interesting discussion about the politics of Medicare for All. And continuing along that thread, we have a question from uh, Amy from American University about whether in the co current political environment, Medicare for all is possible and whether the COVID-19 pandemic might have increased support or decreased support for a Medicare for all type program. 
Yeah, I'll pick that one up. Um, <laughs> we had a little guest here, uh, a, a very pro Medicare for all child. I know she, and she, she believes that we should start with Medicare for kids for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, I actually think that the pandemic has, um, has and could increase support, but it, it's not a foregone conclusion. So much of what is possible is a function of the narrative we established to explain how we got to where we got and where we want to go from here. And if we're honest about the circumstances that we found, and we're honest about the fact that despite the, 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 the worst pandemic in over a century, 15 million people having lost their health care, the health insurance industry made billions of dollars more than they ever expected, and then spent 151 million of that lobbying our politicians across 845 lobbyists, nearly two per member of Congress, to make sure that uh, every COVID bill had some form of kickback for the insurance industry to leave those 15 million people on their insurance in some way, shape, or form. If we're serious about that fact, and we're serious about the fact that we had nurses and doctors and uh, hospital workers wearing garbage bags as they tried to care for the sick and injured, if we're serious about the fact that the medical device industry left us uh, without the ventilators we needed early in the pandemic, simply because a corporation bought another corporation and canceled the contract. If we're serious about the fact that our hospitals um, were facing bankruptcy, 47 of them went through bankruptcy or shut down in the midst of the worst pandemic in over a century. If we're serious about all that, then I think we are in a moment where the conversation about real reform ought to take off. Here's the thing though, it's a choice that we're all gonna make. And um, they're gonna spend a lot of money to make sure that politicians continue to pledge fealty. They're gonna spend a lot of money to make sure that the talking points about losing your healthcare and losing your choice and how we're gonna pay for it uh, pervade. And the question we have to ask is, are we gonna spend our time and our energy and our resources to make sure that the discussion we ought to be having is the discussion in fact that we're having? That, that really is the question. I will say this though, there is a lot to look at and say, um, a lot to look at and say that we're optimistic about. Um, three weeks ago, Representative uh, Jayapal introduced the Medicare for All Act of 2021. It had more co-sponsors than it has ever had. Um, they included people like Frank Pallone, who's nobody's pr progressive, 17 term congressman, uh, who you know is not the kind that you would say, yep, that's, that's a Medicare for All supporter right there. Um, so there's a lot to be optimistic about. And so the question is, are are we willing to, to push this? Our politics in a democracy ought to be about what we choose to do. And um, the question is, are we willing to build the groundswell? We've got a whole chapter in the book called Organizing versus Advertising, because that's what it's going to come down to. Uh, and the question is, are we willing to organize? Thank you, Abdul. Micah, I'd like to ask you about some of the increases in risky health behaviors we've seen over the past couple of decades. Things like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and suicides have just skyrocketed. Many of my colleagues here at AU are actively researching these so-called deaths of despair. Could Medicare for All play a role in reducing disease and death related to risky health behaviors? Yeah, I think the, the work that Anne Case and Angus Deaton and so many others have done on deaths of despair is really eye-opening. And I think there are two levels where healthcare reform like Medicare for All might be able to make a difference. One is in treatment. And folks in the medical profession know well and you know trying to get this out into the public that in particular, Substance use disorders and addiction to opioids is a highly treatable condition. And the, the treatments that we have are some of the most effective in medicine. And I know in my home state of Ohio, one of the biggest um, impetuses um, for expanding Medicaid was the ability to get more people access to treatment for substance use disorders. So I think that at a, a bare minimum, having universal healthcare system and also investing in both the workforce and the policies that let everyone get treatment for these issues is, is critical. But I also think that there's a, a deeper thread here. And one of the fascinating things about professors Case and Deaton's book on deaths of despair is where they put the blame. 
and they put the blame largely at the feet of the healthcare industry, not necessarily because what of what it's doing in healthcare, but of what it's doing to the economy writ large. And the, the fact is that all of these trends that are destroying communities, the loss of good paying jobs, the subcontracting, that means that so many folks with jobs aren't in, in the words of one economist, they're no longer invited to the Christmas party. They're not a part of that company anymore. They're, they're just subcontractors. So many of these trends are because of the exorbitant costs of health insurance and then the fact that we tie health insurance to jobs. So when to the extent that uh, stagnating wages and offshoring and subcontracting are leading to the kinds of economic hardship that make folks susceptible to these diseases of despair, I think there is a real opportunity to transform our economy by transforming the way that we pay for healthcare. And it's not as big a part of the healthcare reform conversation as it should be, but Medicare for all is really a, perhaps a once in a generation opportunity to get trillions of dollars off the backs of folks that have suffered too long under the, the weight of these healthcare costs. Certainly, and I think a theme of this evening's discussion seems to be you know, shifting the, the conversation and the, the priorities around healthcare from this Band-Aid approach, which seems to be what we currently have to a more uh, long-term holistic approach that will address a lot of these issues. So I'd now like to shift into addressing some of the, the nitty gritties of how a system like Medicare for All would really work. And I'll pose a question to Abdul uh, from the audience. Susan has asked about whether there might be levels of Medicare. Would it be that everyone gets a certain level of care or could people purchase additional tiers of care on top of that, uh, which could possibly create a stratified and unfair system much like what we currently have? Yeah, first, um, Susan, thank you for the question. Ideally, no. Um, you know, the, the goal here is that, it is, to step back for a second, like, I, I want you all to think about this. Imagine we had a criminal legal system that penalized murder or assault differently based on the net worth of the individual who was murdered or assaulted, right? In, in effect, we have that moral framework for our healthcare system. If you're poor in this country, treating your body is worth less than if you're rich, even if it's the same body. I mean, and, and that's the facts when it comes to the way that uh, different insurers uh, will reimburse care. So Medicaid reimburses less than, uh, than, than Medicare, which reimburses less than uh, private insurance, which reimburses less if it's like a Cadillac plan versus a not Cadillac plan, uh, depending upon the hospital that you go to. And so um, all of this is to say that like, we want to address that moral failure in the context of our healthcare system, which means that everybody's body should be worth the same because it's worth the same to them. It is the singular most important thing that any of us value, <laughs> aside from maybe like our children's bodies, right? And so the, the point that, um, that, uh, that, that I'm making here is that we want to address that tierage in the system. The other problem is this, is that once you allow the richest folks to buy up into a system, what you've done is created the political economy within which uh, the lower tiers end up getting damaged, right? There's a, there's a famous saying, and I always forget who's attributed to, but um, uh, programs for the poor are recipes for poor programs. And so we need to have a universal system uh, that takes on that, that moral failure in the context of our current system um, and does so in a way that, um, that is sensible. The, the other part of this is that you, you could imagine a system where there was you know, a Medicare for all that was well-funded and valuable enough that it really took care of all your uh, main medical needs and people could potentially buy some sort of uh, complementary insurance that was something akin to a sort of concierge service. Um, but even then, right, there is a worry that it would start encroaching on the public system. And that's why, for example, in Canada, um, they're very, very clear about the fact that there is a, a single system for everyone. And um, you know, that system, for as much as we hear these anecdotal complaints about it, uh, in survey after survey, Canadians are far more, uh, far happier with their system than we are with ours. They live two years uh, on average longer, and every single person um, has insurance. I'd say it's working pretty well. Thank you. And another question about the administration of a Medicare for All program. 
how would it be shared among different levels of government, federal and state? Could you envision Medicare for All as a state-run program? That's a great question. I would say that the way that the current Medicare for All bills are written, it would be much like the Medicare program today, where it would be primarily administered at the federal level. You know, I think there are some good questions, and we try to pose some of these in the book about what would the role of states be or should be, where there's a lot of local and regional knowledge that, you know, state Medicaid programs and state public health programs have built up. And I think that it would be incumbent on a reform like this to try to you know, learn from and take advantage of, of that expertise. Um, you know, with that said, there's kind of a, a different pathway where kind of a separate question is, well, if we can't get Medicare for all in, in the next two years, how about states trying it on their own? And you see a lot of energy in places like New York and California and Washington state and a couple other places that are trying to get serious about moving through legislation at the state level um, to move towards a single payer system. And Abdul and I get this question a lot. And I think our, our my general sense is you can do these things simultaneously where a lot of both the political and policy work that it takes to, to build a system like this on the state level is very similar to at the federal level. And I think that the more energy there is around doing these reforms, no matter at what scale they're at, you know, I think is only, only for the better. Sure, it'll be very interesting to see um, how this plays out and whether uh, a state run Medicare for all type program can uh, perhaps serve as a, a model for a future federal program. Another question about the administration of Medicare for all so the book touches upon some of the perverse incentives and pitfalls of large private insurance companies, uh, such as insurers negotiating lower rates with providers, but then pocketing the profits for themselves rather than passing the savings on to patients. So what sorts of checks and balances would be required and feasible to ensure that similar profiteering doesn't happen with public insurance plan plans like Medicare for All? I mean, if, if <laughs> this is the crazy thing, I mean, if the government did that, it, it'd be like frank corruption, right? I mean, that, that, that's what it would be. Um, uh, and, and so it just it removes the incentives um, because right now we've basically said that it is okay to profiteer off of healthcare. Like that, that's what we've said. And we've incentivized both the insurance industry and the healthcare industry to do that thing. And it creates all sorts of problems in uh, in healthcare, and you know, by 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 changing our public policy around this, by uh, making government our employ our in insurer, uh, what it does is that it addresses those disincentives, and it would make it, frankly, a crime if if you know some you can imagine some insurance administrator trying to pocket some costs off the system. Like that's just frankly criminal. Um, and the the question actually, I think, inadvertently kind of demonstrates how absurd it is that we allow this to happen. In the first place, right? Because if it was a government-run system and some insurance administrator just, you know, denied people their coverage and then pocketed the money, we'd call that a crime. But because it's a for-profit system, that's just how you do business. Um, and it's absurd to me, right? Because the same moral aspects apply. People paid for their health care and then ultimately ended up allowing some. CEO to pocket the money. I mean, the, the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, which is 70% of the market share in my state, made 19 million bucks in 2018, $19 million. Could you imagine, right, the administrator of CMS being like, yeah, I denied people their healthcare, but I pocketed $19 million and us celebrating him as some sort of like hero, right? And just like, well, you know, great business leader. Um, th that I think it just, it, it demonstrates the, the, the rank absurdity of the current system um, and, you know, it, it, we would be doing the best we could. I mean, I mean, we can't control people behaving criminally, right? I, I, ideally, we, we don't want them to do that. And we have laws against that. But at some point, if people want to be criminals, they can be criminals. But it, it addresses the, 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 the disincentive to make that legal and make that a norm of doing business. Certainly, yes. And uh, we would hope that, you know, people would hold their, their elected officials and their, their government leaders accountable uh, for this kind of behavior. We have another question from an audience member, which I'll pose to Micah. Heather from Maryland has asked, would there be incentives for wellness or prevention programs that encourage people to stay healthy uh, so that there's less disease and sickness from lifestyle choices 
many large companies have such wellness programs to try to keep workers healthy um, and presumably also reduce their share of health insurance costs. So, you know, as someone who reads a lot of research on healthcare, I often find myself in the position of pouring cold water on all sorts of uh, trendy ideas and the workplace wellness programs, it just turns out to be, you know, in randomized controlled trials, they just don't work. It doesn't really make a difference in terms of uh, keeping people healthy and certainly not in terms of reducing healthcare costs. Um, so unfortunately that goes into the, the large pile of all sorts of things that we've, that we've tried, but it's really hard to move the needle on healthcare costs. But um, I, I really like Heather's question and, and I'm glad that you asked it because the problem in the current system, when it talks about, when we talk about long-term incentives, um, the problem in the current system is neither your employer nor a health insurance company really has the incentive to make investments that are gonna make a difference not just next year or the year after, but 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in the future. And you know, one of the cardiologists at my hospital talks about there is a discussion of a medication that would essentially be an injection that you would take once or twice a year that would plummet your cholesterol and re reduce your risk of heart attack. It's almost like a vaccine against heart disease. And they go to these cardiology conferences and they say, well, the problem is you're not going to get any insurance company to pay for that. Um, why? Well, because this prevents disease 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in the future, and you're going to be on a different insurance plan by the time uh, you get the benefit. So the difference under Medicare for all is that it is the, the same pockets that are paying for the healthcare today, get the savings on the back end. And I think as our technology gets more advanced, we're going to run up against this problem more and more where if you're thinking on a one to two year time frame, yeah, you're just not gonna make the right investments in prevention and public health. Um, but I think under Medicare for all, you have that incentive. And that's for two reasons. One is the reason I just described where you get the savings 10 or 20 years in the future. Um, but the other reason is that we can also stop thinking about healthcare investments as something that you need to turn a profit on. Um, because the other thing that's, still you know kind of upsets me is i used to think that investing in prevention of course that must save money but it just turns out that oftentimes it does cost money to make people healthier um, and as the government part of this the social mission the purpose of government is to spend collective resources to improve people's lives even if it doesn't save money so i also also think that uh, a program like medicare or medicare for all we should also think of as a public health program that makes investments to make people healthier and that we should be making those investments, um, even if they don't turn a profit on the back end. Thank you, Micah. And it's very interesting, as you mentioned, that oftentimes these wellness programs, things that we think sound good in theory, um, don't you know, always yield the results we would hope for. If anyone is interested in learning more about these workplace wellness programs and their outcomes, I would point you to a study by Damon Jones and co-authors uh, in which they study the Illinois Workplace Wellness Study, uh, Il sorry, the Illinois Workplace Wellness Program and uh, find some kind of interesting and surprising results. Um, now, I would like to ask Abdul about um, some of the reasons why healthcare outcomes in the US are, are so much worse than those of our peer countries. We all here in the audience are, are well aware that we in the US have very high healthcare costs uh, for various reasons that you discussed in the book as well as during uh, your talk today. But why are our healthcare outcomes so much worse in spite of our higher healthcare spending? I'll say a couple of things. The first is that most health outcomes are an average. And we are uh, one of the most unequal countries in the world, certainly the most unequal high income country in the world. And that means that. Um, even while those at the upper strata of outcomes do well, those on the bottom strata of outcomes do extremely poorly. And that reflects in our averages. I also think that those averages tend to you know, perform a certain statistical violence against people who suffer those bad outcomes because in fact, our outcomes, if you were to look at the lowest income, most marginalized people, look a lot more like they do in low and middle income countries than they do in high income countries. And 
Um, in reflecting simply the averages, we miss that point. The other piece here that I think is, is really, worth, um, uh, really worth focusing on uh, is the fact that most health happens outside of clinics and hospitals. Um, clinics and hospitals are the places that people go to fix the problems once they've already occurred. And all of the disincentives that you all just talked about around the fact that we don't invest in keeping people healthy in the places where they live, learn, and, 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 and work and play, um, that's the real reason why our outcomes are so bad. And if we don't have an incentive to do that, um, if we don't have incentive to invest in clean air and, and clean drinking water, to invest in walkable communities and access to healthy foods, to invest in uh, uh, communities that have social infrastructure that bring people together, that support uh, mental health, that don't expose people to trauma. If we're not doing the things that we need to do to protect and promote health in the communities that people come from, um, expecting our healthcare system that's more focused on profit than it is on patients to solve the problem um, is, is a bit of an anathema. And, and, and that's the situation that we find ourselves in, unfortunately. Thank you, Abdul. We're now reaching uh, the end of our session today. So I'd like to pose a final question to you both. Abdul had mentioned that the fight for Medicare for all will come down to organizing versus advertising. So what would your advice be for an audience member who heard your talk tonight and maybe inspired to do something to contribute to healthcare reform? What are ways that people can get involved? Is there a role that students could play? I'll jump in quickly on that one. Yes, absolutely. And there are a lot of amazing organizations doing a lot of amazing work. Folks like Be Hero, folks like Public Citizen and Social Security Works, uh, folks like the Nurses Union and SEIU. And please do get involved and, and become an organizer with a capital O. But even if you can't be an organizer with a capital O, there's a lot of organizing to be done with a lowercase o. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it's valuable, of course, to have one person talking to a thousand people. I would rather have a thousand people talking to one person each, right? And if you can have this conversation with your loved ones, your uh, your family and your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors and talk to them about this issue and ask them to situate themselves in our system. That's great. And the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, th there is, uh, I'm going to use a, a science analogy here just because I think it's elegant and it may not work, but it might. Um, the way that our brains uh, communicate with the rest of our bodies are through these, these incredible um, neuronal cells. And there's a real hard problem about moving a signal all the way down your body. And one of the ways that um, our bodies do this, they solve the problem is by doing this thing called saltatory conduction, which literally means jumping conduction. And, um, and I sometimes think about changing people's minds as saltatory conduction. It's not as much about getting them to look at you and say, you know what, you showed me the light about Medicare for all and now I understand. That rarely happens, right? Um, it's never happened to me and I spend my whole life thinking about this stuff. So rather it's worth asking people to situate themselves in the system and say, how is this working for you? Ask questions, don't give answers. And then let people go for a while, right? And you'll find that the next time you talk to them, right, they've jumped. Over time, you start moving people, right? And so if you're more focused on winning the future rather than winning the argument, right, you can be like a neuron and, and get people to move. Great advice. Micah, would you uh, like to add anything? Yeah, I would echo what uh, what Abdul said, and you know, just talking about this issue in your own life, you know, sharing your own experiences, asking people about their experiences, and I do think that for any major health reform, it is going to require a huge coalition and a big tent of people who don't agree on everything, you know. But my my hope for this movement to make healthcare a human right is to be is to be open and inviting and to welcome people in and ask questions and invite people's perspectives. Because I think it's only through that shared understanding. And it really is unfortunately the fact that so many people have experienced indignity or injustice, either large or small in our healthcare system. And I think that's by starting with that point of connection, I think that's the way to, to build the base. And I really do believe that we are, we're going to see major changes in our healthcare system um, in our lifetimes. We, it's just simply not sustainable what we have now. So that's why I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of the event. I'm grateful for all the questions and all the interest, um, because I think that we're, we're only going to continue to work on this issue together. Well, we can probably continue this conversation all night, but unfortunately, it is time to conclude. So big thank you to our speakers, Abdul and Micah, for being with us today. 
And thank you to all our attendees. A reminder that you can learn more about Abdul and Micah's work as well as their book, Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide through the links in the chat box. We look forward to seeing you at the next sign event. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our amazing moderator. Thank you all. Thank you.